Hello, everyone. Um, I am excited to be here today. I want to say thank you uh, to Simons and the Spark Foundation for having me and having uh, Dr. Jeste here today to speak. Um, I'm excited to speak about a topic that's near and dear to my heart, both as a child neurologist and as a clinician scientist who studies this area. So the title of my talk is The Importance of Motor Function and Physical Activity in Autism Spectrum Disorder. Um, and again, I'm Dr. Rigitha Wilson, and I'm a child neurologist uh, from UCLA. So the outline today of what we'll be talking about is uh, first uh, a little bit about motor skills in individuals with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, and then we're going to move over to discuss how we measure motor function, um, including innovative ways to measure motor function um, and motor skills. Then we'll move over to the importance of physical activity interventions um, and sports programs, interventions that target these motor skills and motor function. Um, and lastly, we'll finish off with an example of a specific sports program um, for individuals with autism. So why is motor function important in autism? Well, we know from many studies and from our research that motor challenges are common uh, in individuals with autism, and they often present very early, sometimes even prior to what we describe as core symptoms of ASD. And so this is important when we think about diagnosing children earlier and providing intervention earlier. We also know that there is a relationship between motor function and motor skills and other areas of development, such as social communication, adaptive function, and even higher level peer relationships. And lastly, we also know that motor function and motor skills are a target for intervention. And we have interventions for motor skills right now, such as occupational therapy, physical therapy, and sports programs. So when we think right now about the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, we use the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And in order to clinically diagnose autism spectrum disorder, uh, individuals need to meet two categories or criteria in two categories. That's social communication impairments and repetitive behaviors and restricted interests. And we have specifiers to aid in making a more comprehensive diagnosis. So these are things, as you can see from the arrows above, such as expressive language level or level of support needed. And then in the DSM-5, we also have associated features supporting a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And right now, motor deficits are listed as an associated feature. And in the DSM, these are things like odd gait, clumsiness, and abnormal motor signs. And in today's talk, what I want to highlight is why I think it's important that we start thinking about these motor deficits, maybe not as only associated features, and perhaps not as a core diagnostic criteria, but something that is a specifier or that is specifically screened for um, so that we can provide caregivers and clinicians with more information on how we wanna screen for these motor difficulties and ways to provide intervention for them. And one of the reasons for that will be highlighted as I give you guys a little bit more information. So we noted that motor challenges and delays are very common in individuals with autism spectrum disorder. And from several studies, uh, we have highlighted the fact that the prevalence of motor challenges exist early in life and really go across the lifespan, uh, both in children with autism spectrum disorder and adults. So this table here highlights a few different things. The left column are something that we call motor domains. So those are things like gross motor coordination. And gross motor skills are the ability um, or the things required um, for control of the large muscles of the body. So those are things such as the way you move your arms and legs, crawling, walking, running. Then there's fine motor skills, so that's smaller movements, such as picking up objects, holding a spoon, holding a pencil, buttoning your shirt. And then there are things such as higher level motor systems. Um, so those are things like postural control, balance, the way you integrate your vision with your movement, and things like motor planning, 
so the ability to catch a ball or throw a ball. And here we see in the next column and the one after that that these motor challenges and delays in multiple different motor domains have been shown in studies both in infants at risk for autism, which we'll talk a little bit more in upcoming slides, toddlers with autism, and even children and adults. And it's important to note that each individual might have a different pattern of challenges or a different domains that are affected. And depending on that, it would change the way in which we evaluate individuals, uh, their motor difficulties, and what interventions we might provide them. So not only do we know that motor challenges and delays are prevalent um, across a lifespan in individuals with autism spectrum disorder, but numerous studies have shown that they might also be the first sign of atypical development. So here at UCLA and at many other sites, we've began studying, or have been studying, I should say, infants who are at risk for autism spectrum disorder. So those are infants who have a sibling with autism. And from our studies, we know that they have a 20% higher risk of developing autism compared to about the 1.5% risk that the general population has. So in these studies, we've shown that infants at risk for autism are not able to roll over or sit at four to six months of age compared to infants who are not at risk for autism. We've also seen atypical walking in the first and second year of life. And what's important to note, which I've alluded to before, is that these studies are showing that these motor differences and delays were identified actually prior to when those core diagnostic symptoms of ASD are sometimes noted. And this is really important when we think about how can we identify children who are at risk for autism or at risk for neurodevelopmental delays really early in life so that we can implement interventions to improve later neurodevelopmental outcomes? So this graph that you see here to the right was a study that actually prospectively looked at infants at six months, nine months, and 12 months, and 14 months of age who are at risk for autism and those who weren't and then all the way through three years of age um, to determine whether or not they met a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. So the blue line indicates low-risk infants. That's infants without a sibling with autism. The red line is high-risk infants. These are infants with a sibling with autism who did not then receive a diagnosis of autism at three years of age. And the green line are infants who are at high risk of autism and did receive an autism diagnosis of three years of age. And what you can see here on the green line is that those infants who are at high risk and received a later diagnosis of autism showed clear delays in standing. So at 12, 14 months of age, when the low-risk infants were clearly achieving standing, these infants were not. But it's also important to know, both when we think about clinical diagnosis and surveillance for kids who are at risk, that even the infants who did not go on to receive a diagnosis of autism, the fact that they're at higher risk, they also showed some delays. Aside from knowing that it is the first sign, possibly one of the first signs, I should say, of atypical development, we also know that there is a relationship between motor development and other areas of development, such as language and social communication. We know that when a child goes from crawling to walking, there's rapid engagement with the environment. They're now able to uh, reach out to their caregivers, to peers. Their arms are opened up for things such as gestures, uh, social referencing, things that we call joint attention, which is a triadic skill between a child, their parent or caregiver, and an object of interest. Uh, and we also know that they're able to then engage with other objects and things in the environment, increasing their ability to maybe understand what's going on and develop things like language. And so this study where you see these graphs over to the right looked at exactly that. They looked at infants every two weeks, um, all the way from crawling through the onset of walking, and simultaneously uh, did a questionnaire called the MacArthur Bates Vocabulary Checklist to look at their receptive vocabulary, their ability to understand language, and their productive vocabulary, or their ability to have expressive language. And what they found was there was a significant increase in receptive and productive vocabulary when infants went from crawling to walking. And this continued as their walking experience continued. And you see in the second graph, the productive vocabulary, that there was a little bit of a plateau two weeks or so into walking. And this is a time where researchers feel that infants are first getting to know their environment and explore their environment. 
And then we continue to see a burst of expressive language as they are able to further engage with the environment. But what these researchers also did is they compared infants who are crawling and walking at the same age and saw what their vocabulary was at that point. And they saw that infants who are walking at the same age as infants who are crawling had greater receptive and productive vocabulary. So it wasn't just that the language was increased due to age, but perhaps really the ability to walk or gain better gross motor skills compared to just the crawling infants. And what they saw overall was that infants and toddlers with greater exploration showed greater vocabulary. So what this really shows us is that we can't separate developmental domains such as motor and language. We really have to think about how they might affect one another and how they might develop together when we're both studying them and examining them clinically. So when we think about the fact that motor challenges um, are prevalent, they can affect children across the lifespan, um, and that there's a relationship with other areas of development. We also want to think about how these motor deficits and challenges might impact physical activity, health outcomes, and overall social well-being. So studies have looked at how these motor challenges or deficits might affect uh, sedentary behavior. And studies have shown that individuals with autism spectrum disorder, when compared to their typically developing peers, are not meeting the recommended 60 minutes of physical activity a day. And actually, one study led by Dr. Neumeier looked at boys with autism spectrum disorder ages 8 to 17 years of age and saw that only 27% of them were very active compared to 79% of their typically developing peers. But what they also studied was their bone mineral density. And they found that these boys had reduced bone mineral density, which puts them at risk for things like osteoporosis and bone fractures. So the same group looked also at children and adults retrospectively. They looked at children and adults with autism spectrum disorder who visited the emergency department at their hospital. And what they found was these individuals actually had higher rates of fractures. And some of these fractures are maybe what we might more typically see in teenagers, such as arm fractures. But what they also saw was that there was a higher rate of hip fractures in individuals with autism spectrum disorder. And this is concerning because hip fractures are generally things that we might see in the elderly population who are not having as much physical activity or who have osteoporosis. These are not fractures that we should be seeing in teenagers. And lastly, we also know that greater sedentary behavior can lead to higher rates of obesity, which leads to other medical problems such as high blood sugar and high cholesterol. So when we also think about these motor deficits, we begin wondering if there is greater sedentary behavior, how might this also affect peer interaction? And we wonder whether or not when kids are doing things at five years of age, such as running around on the playground, um, engaging in sports activities, that if there are motor challenges leading to more sedentary behavior or not participating in these sports activities, that these are really missed opportunities to engage with their peers, leading to more reduced peer interactions, which is already a concern for individuals with autism spectrum disorder. And there's also been studies showing what then are children and adults and teenagers with autism maybe um, adding into their time rather than participating in physical activity. And what we're seeing is they're replacing that physical activity with increased screen time. So this means not only less interaction with their peers, but even with other family members. So when we do see these missed peer opportunities uh, or reduced peer interaction, we also wonder what that means for behavioral, uh, social functioning, and sort of overall emotional social functioning. And we have studies showing that poor motor coordination um, are associated with greater social and emotional difficulties. This study led by Dr. Papadopoulos showed that when they measured behavioral and social functioning um, in young boys with autism spectrum disorder, and also um, their motor skills using the movement assessment battery for children, those who had poor coordination also showed, as I noted, greater social and emotional difficulties. And there's also been qualitative studies 
uh, noting that children with autism might be worried about not being accepted by their peers or not being accepted on the playground to engage with different um, physical activity interventions. And what we know that is that these motor deficits might lead to affecting each of these individual areas, but it actually becomes sort of a vicious cycle where these motor deficits can lead to more sedentary behavior, which in turn uh, to reduce peer interaction and perhaps then more greater behavioral difficulties. So what do we need to do in order to improve those motor deficits or target those motor deficits? Well, in order to do that, we first need to measure motor function and measure these motor challenges so that we can get a better idea of what perhaps are the specific motor difficulties or motor delays um, for each individual with autism, and what might be the best interventions that target these specific motor difficulties. So to measure motor function, we use a variety of different things. As a child neurologist, I do a thorough exam of different motor abilities, such as coordination and tone, gait, but we also have things like caregiver questionnaires. Those are things like the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scales, which not only look at social communication and adaptive functioning, but gross and fine motor ability. And then we also have standardized measures of motor function. So these measures are used to evaluate things such as manual dexterity, such as movement assessment battery for children uh, who does, that does manual dexterity, coordination, aiming, catching. We have the Mullen scales of early learning, which is for children from birth to three years of age, which includes gross and fine motor scale. And then we even have standardized measures to measure infants, such as the Alberta Infant Motor Scale. But even though we have these measures, we sometimes still struggle to really evaluate children with autism um, who might have really low expressive language, intellectual disability, or really profound motor deficits. But also what we struggle with is capturing perhaps more subtle or specific motor deficits that these individuals have or the quality of these motor challenges. So what I mean by that is perhaps these measures are able to evaluate whether a child is able to walk or not, or hold a pen or not, but how they're able to do those things is very important to us, particularly as a child neurologist, because if certain areas of walking are affecting, are affected, I'm gonna start thinking about where in the brain there might be issues in order for us to target those areas with specific interventions. And I like to use this example on the slide here. This is a drawing trail, uh, measuring manual dexterity out of the movement assessment battery for children. And the goal is for a child to trace uh, this entire trail. Now that's important to measure manual dexterity, but in order to receive full points, the child needs to be able to trace the entire trail without lifting up their pen and without moving out of the lines. And that can be really difficult for some of our younger children or children who have more behavioral difficulties or may not understand some of the, complex, some of the complexities of this task. So here at UCLA, we're starting to think about innovative methods in which we can measure motor skills or use quantitative measures to measure motor skills in individuals with autism, and also measures in which children with intellectual disability, behavioral difficulties, um, are able to participate in these motor measures. So here at UCLA, my team and I are starting to use different quantitative measures. And one of those is quantitative gait analysis. So here in this video, I'm gonna show you the use of a quantitative gait mat. This mat is three different layers, and one of the layers holds pressure sensors. And those pressure sensors allow us to start thinking about ways in which children walk rather than just their ability to walk. So let me show you the first video. The first video is a sibling of a child with autism, and this child does not have autism. So when we play this video, what we see down at the bottom of the screen are her footsteps. And there's a green line, and in that green line, we can clearly see that her center of mass is straight. In the middle box, what we're seeing are the actual pressure or the sensors of her right foot and her left foot. And what we can see is that she's fully utilizing what we expect in normal gait, which is going from the heel to the toe and using in her entire foot. And in the right corner, what we see is something called a cyclogram. And that beautiful hourglass figure that you see there is showing that she's going from double stance to single stance, which is something that we expect to see in more typical gait. So 
what happens when we test her sister who has autism? Well, when we look at her on the gate mat and we play this video, what sort of strikingly first stands out is that her footsteps are really wide. Even qualitatively in her video, you can see she's almost waddling back and forth. And that green line shows that her center of mass is not staying straight. Instead, she's really trying to move from one side to the other in order to balance that center of mass. What we also see that's striking, particularly for me as a child neurologist, is in that middle panel where we see her footsteps, we see that that white area or that center of pressure is not equal on her right foot. And for a child neurologist, that's concerning to me because I'm going to start thinking about what might be affected in the brain that's leading to that asymmetry. And do I need to obtain things like an MRI or imaging of the brain to see if there's any abnormalities there? So let's compare both of their walks side by side. When we look at both of their walks, you can see on the left-hand side is the sibling with, without autism, and on the right panel, the sibling with autism. And the table to the right highlights what we describe their walking kinematic variables. So just in looking at the pictures, we see that there's some clear differences. But when we start deriving some of that quantitative data, we first look at the velocity or the speed at which they're walking, the length of steps that they're using, and the width of steps. And here on the right columns, we see the, the kinematic variables for the sibling with autism, the sibling without autism, and then the last panel are normative values or values from a greater population of kids who are typically be developing, we say, or kids who, individuals who don't have autism in that four to five year age range. And what we see is that our child with autism, the velocity or the speed at which she's walking is less than half of her sibling and even lower than normative or typically developing values. The length of her steps is far reduced and the width of her steps is much larger. So as a child neurologist, this is now going on, going beyond just telling me whether or not they're able to walk, but it's giving me a better idea that perhaps her velocity is slower because she has reduced strength or lower tone, leading her to walk a little bit slower. Maybe the width of her steps is wider or her gait is wider because she's trying to gain the stability due to her low tone in order to be able to walk or maintain her balance. And from that, I'm able to really determine, all right, is there a certain area of the brain or her muscles that might be affecting her gait? And what might be the best intervention to target these, these areas of difficulty? So we talk about measuring children with autism, but when we think about these quantitative measures, we also want to think about how we might extend that to earlier in life. So I mentioned earlier in this talk that we know that infants who are at risk for autism show delays in motor skills as early as four to six months of age. But when we bring these kids, these infants in to be studied either in the clinic or in research setting, we imagine that we're really only getting 30 minutes to an hour of their movement. And infants really have many different behaviors throughout the day, as many of you might know from personal experience. And so in order to really capture their full repertoire of behaviors, we need to be thinking about measuring them in their natural environment, not in the research or the clinic setting, and for longer periods of time. So here at UCLA and with our collaborators at USC, we're using things such as wearable sensors that, as you can see from the photo here, are about the size of the quarter and weigh about the same to measure infant movements at home throughout a full day. And our really early data is that we're starting to see that these motor challenges are emerging, or I should say differences, as early as three months of age. And now we're gonna move beyond that to see how these early motor differences might predict later neurodevelopmental outcomes. So from that, I wanna move over to thinking about, now that we've talked about why motor um, function is important in autism spectrum disorder, the fact that motor challenges are present early and throughout a lifespan, how we measure motor function and innovative ways to measure motor function for individuals with varying levels of behavior and cognitive abilities. And I wanna move over to think about ways in which we uh, provide intervention or target motor function. And we do have things such as occupational therapy and physical therapy, which are greatly beneficial. But what I'm gonna actually focus on are physical activity interventions and sports programs that target motor function. 
Uh, and one of the reasons is because we want to think about the fact that a lot of these programs are available and how can we leverage these programs or use these programs to benefit individuals with autism spectrum disorder. So to give you some examples of physical activity programs, um, I searched the literature to take a look at what might be out there, not only of physical activity intervention programs that are available um, and have been used for individuals with autism, but I chose these three particular studies because these are programs that have actually been adapted for children with autism, or these studies have utilized, and they had a little bit more of a rigorous study design. So the first study uh, looked at horseback riding, and uh, what they used were horseback riding and relevant warm-up ex exercises adapted to individuals with autism used prior to the writing. And they had two groups, uh, children with autism who were enrolled within the intervention, the horseback riding, and those who were on a wait list. And they measured before and after the program, the program social motivation and attention, and also some other areas. But what I highlight here is that they showed improved social motivation, improved attention, less sedentary activity, one thing that I highlighted earlier, and that overall these children were less distracted. The second study used uh, a form of Australian football that was specifically adapted for individuals with autism spectrum disorder. And they measured both motor skills as well as other behavioral areas. And they saw improved coordination, object control, as well as social skills. The last study was a swimming, swimming program. And that swimming program uh, individuals uh, with autism either continued in their regular intervention schedule or in this specifically adapted swimming program. And what they found were that the individuals who were in the swimming program showed improved social competence and even reduced irritability. And so what this highlights is that these programs not only improved motor skills, but some other developmental areas as well. So as I searched this literature, what I also saw was there's a paucity in the field of sort of these standardized studies of programs uh, that are specifically adapted for individuals with autism spectrum disorder. So we were curious to know what else is out there and what might be available geographically. And so we asked all of you guys. So with the help of our friends at Spark, we sent a survey out to all of you. Uh, our responses were from a mix of caregivers and adults um, with uh, caregivers and adults with autism spectrum disorder, as well as healthcare professionals and researchers. And there was a total of 344 responses. And we were excited to see that about 50% of the responses indicated that there were physical activity programs available specifically for individuals with autism spectrum disorder. So we were curious to know what those programs are. So we asked that. And what we found was there was a range of programs. So here you can see those specific programs such as tennis, soccer, dance, basketball, martial arts. But what this highlights is that these different programs are programs that might be individual activities, such as tennis um, or martial arts. Some of these are team sports, such as soccer and basketball. Others re have more physical contact. Others might require more coordination or memorization, such as dance. And all of these programs were programs that were able to be adapted for individuals with autism, and individuals with autism participated in these programs. So next steps in this would be to really figure out how are these programs adapted, and what are these programs doing to help individuals with autism specifically? But what we did ask was, what benefit did all of you see from participation in these programs or your child's participation in these programs? And what we saw were some areas that maybe we expected, so improvements in motor skills or in fitness. But what was also striking to see is there were many other areas of improvement. So it wasn't just motor skills, but things such as social skills, language, overall well-being. And as a child neurologist, I was especially excited to see that sleep is improved. And that's because we screen for sleep issues in individuals with autism spectrum disorder. And we know that over 80% of children with autism can have insomnia or disrupted sleep, and that improved sleep improves overall behavior and can help with cognition and can help with learning. But what was also really important and striking for me to see was that there was improvement in confidence. And I think that's so vital because confidence can be carried to other activities and to other programs. And 
I can hopefully improve those perception of other peers um, that these individuals might be concerned about or the likelihood to participate in other programs. And what was also nice to see is that many of these benefits were sustained. So not only just during the program, but even after the program, we saw improvements in motor skills, fitness, and other areas of development. And this really highlights the fact that all of these areas are related, that we can't separate motor skills from these other developmental domains. And it's important when we think about measuring these programs or developing intervention programs that target motor function, that we not only measure motor skills, but that we measure other areas of behavior and well-being. And here at UCLA, we're doing those things. We're not only measuring improvement in motor skills, but we're looking at adaptive functioning in language um, with the introduction of physical activity programs. But what we also asked all of you is, how can these programs improve? And it was clear that there's still some gaps and some needs for physical activity and sports programs. So in regards to how programs can improve, we saw that there needs to be greater availability and accessibility, uh, better advertising of these programs, consistent availability, and more autism-specific programs for individuals across the spectrum, so those with higher functioning and also those for children with greater needs. But we are also curious to know why some of you might not participate in these programs. And predominantly what we saw is that these programs might not be available, unaware that these programs exist, um, or that these programs don't meet specific needs. We also saw that many of you were maybe not interested in participating in these programs. And perhaps if we start developing programs that are more specific to these children, there could be more interest generated. So how do we address these gaps? Well, we need to think about as we go back uh, to the first area of this talk where motor deficits uh, may not be a core diagnostic feature of autism spectrum disorder, but clearly we have now seen that they are prevalent and that they can affect other areas of development. So it's important that we appropriately screen for motor challenges and delays in children and individuals with autism spectrum disorder, and in those with varying degrees of ability, not just our higher functioning, but those who might have more profound motor difficulties. It's also important that we systematically measure the benefit of these physical activity programs on not only motor skills, but also behavior, so that we can design programs specific to the needs of these children and individuals, but also because if we provide these sort of evidence-based um, improvements or outcomes, we can advocate for these physical activity interventions. And perhaps as a child neurologist, one day I can even hopefully prescribe evidence-based physical activity intervention programs for individuals with autism spectrum disorder. And the goal really being that if we can identify these early motor difficulties very early on, appropriately screen for them and develop interventions that target these motor difficulties <clears throat> and are really um, sort of made specifically for individuals with autism spectrum disorder, we can see improvement in overall development. <clears throat> so with that, I do wanna thank all of you for your time. And what I'd like to do is actually move over uh, this over to my, um, my colleague, Dr. Jeste, to speak about a specific uh, program tennis program for individuals with autism. So yeah, that was a great overview by Dr. Bott. And I wish um, when uh, we, you know, we were developing uh, acing autism that, you know, we had realized that there was such a big gap. But, you know, the reality is, is that we um, recognize just through my sort of clinical experience that I'll talk about that, you know, children with autism were not really receiving um, opportunities to engage in um, sports programs, and it was in that context that this was developed. So I'm a researcher at UCLA and also a child neurologist, and, but I also wear another hat, which is that I'm on the board of directors of a program called AC Autism, which um, I helped to start in 2008. Um, and it really was, you know, built, um, let's see, sorry, I'm making sure this one, oh, sorry. Um, and AC Autism really was um, the product of a recognition that uh, children with autism were not having access to sports programs the way that, you know, typically developing kids were in the community. And so way back in 2008, when I was seeing patients in clinic, you know, patients were coming to me and asking me for prescriptions for, you know, sports programs and asking about whether there were any available programs that I knew about in the Boston area and others. And when I started exploring, I realized that not only were there not very many programs, the ones that were available were often not 
um, really targeting the specific areas of need of children with autism. So they were much more broad and for children with different types of special needs, many of which were not really relevant um, to autism. And so um, Richard Sperling, who's the CEO and co-founder of, and really the founder of Acing Autism, um, he is a um, tennis pro and was a Division I tennis player. Um, and I approached him at that time in 2008 and said, you know, are there tennis, you know, could we think about developing a tennis program for children with autism? Uh, and that idea, which, you know, I can take credit for, you know, having some um, role in the idea, but ever since then, the program that I'll talk about is really the product of hard work with Richard and um, his team. Uh, you know, he looked into it and realized that there really weren't tennis programs for children with autism around the country, and so why don't we try to develop one? And that's really where the idea started. Um, the mission of Acing Autism is to connect children with autism through unique tennis programs and to develop an advanced proven method to positively impact children, families, and communities. And I have on the bottom a link to the website, which has a really nice description of the programs um, there that you can actually um, access. Go to the next slide. So that was an idea in 2008, and we started with one program in Boston. Uh, we piloted it with two children, and at that time, Richard had never actually met a child with autism and quickly learned that there were um, some areas that needed to be adapted to be able to, again, um, address and help uh, these children. Uh, Ten years later, this program has grown phenomenally, and this really, I think, speaks to some of the gaps that um, were addressed and Dr. Boss talked through the survey that there really was a need here. And so quickly, um, Acing Autism has tried to meet that need. Um, and now 10 years later, the program is all over the country, 28 states, there's 62 programs with 700 participants. And what's really amazing is over 2,000 volunteers. So there's volunteers that span high school um, all the way up to you know, late adulthood, um, individuals, some of whom are um, affected by autism, you know, by having family members or loved ones who have autism or are just really interested in learning more and helping. And so we've really uh, engaged a large community in this goal of helping uh, children with autism. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the program. And again, the, I think, you know, talking about this in the context of what you've heard um, is helpful. Again, as I said, I, you know, we didn't know about all these data around sort of the need of, um, for programs to be so autism specific and those sorts of things. So it's really nice to hear that those data are now there because I think that ACing Autism has already sort of started to meet or, or address some of those gaps. Um, but here's some pictures from the program and I'll talk to you a little bit more about it in detail. Um, so the program was developed um, in, um, as, you know, with a committee essentially of experts. And the main experts are parents um, because they obviously know their children best and know what their needs are. We also had some autism specialists, both clinicians and other types of providers, as well as tennis professionals, of course, because they can think about how to adapt specifically the sport of tennis to the needs of children with autism. We really wanted to prioritize including children who were excluded from many programs. And you know, I'll say from my perspective, and I'm sure from Dr. Boss also, many of the patients we see in clinic are children who are minimally verbal, have rather profound areas of need and challenges, and many times those are the kids who are excluded from programs because they need more help, they need more guidance. And we really wanted to develop a program that would include those children. So we also wanted to develop a program that was able to be individualized for different types of needs because, as we know, autism is a very large spectrum um, and, you know, one size does not fit all by any means, yet still have it be structured and potentially manualized enough that um, a basic program could be taught and implemented across many sites. Um, along those lines, we also wanted to have a combination of both individual skill building based on the needs of the child, as well as being able to have some group activities which would enhance social skills and participation. Um, another important goal was to actually have an opportunity for parents to get a break. So certainly in some programs, parents do get on the court and help, but we really wanted to have a, a, you know, a system built where there were enough volunteers and experts on the court that parents could actually have an hour where they could talk to other parents or just relax and rest because we know how much work it is to be shuttling their children from activity to activity. Um, and then finally, based on sort of some of those goals, um, we really wanted to develop some, again, standardized manuals that were both, you know, hard copy manuals and videos that would allow for this program to be implemented across multiple sites. 
In addition, there was another goal of just using this platform of this program to build a community. And that's something that AC Autism, I think, has done really well, and much of this has been led by um, the Chief Marketing Officer, Alex Huggin, um, at AC Autism, where AC Autism has really built a strong social media presence through Facebook groups and um, other platforms. There's also a quarterly newsletter that's distributed to thousands of individuals. This is just a screenshot of one of the newsletters that has, you know, updates on exciting things happening in autism research, as well as um, updates on just the programs, highlights of participants and volunteers. And it's a really nice way, to, I think, to engage the community. So I'm going to um, talk to you just briefly about the program itself. And again, this is just to sort of give a flavor of how those goals have been implemented in a more autism-specific program. Again, this is work I take very little credit for the actual implementation of the program. This is really Richard and then Justin Belisario, who's the COO, and a whole team of experts who have really put their heart and soul into developing this, this program. But essentially, the program is um, typically an eight-week session. Each session is a one-hour-per-week clinic. Um, there is at least a one-to-one -one staff to child ratio, so sometimes children need more help, and then the ratio is two-to-one staff to child. Um, the sessions are divided based on ages of participants, so there's usually a one-hour session for um, very early childhood to age 10, and then a second session up to age 18. And that just allows, again, for some of the programming to be more specific to the age and need of the individuals. Um, there are training sessions that are provided to the staff before the launch of new programs. Um, and then we also actually provide surveys to parents to complete at the start and end of session, and I'll show you that in a minute. So the actual program looks like this, and again, I'm just going to give you snapshots, but on the website there's actually, and I think I have a slide and a couple of slides that gives you the link to the videos, but there are um, training videos and example videos of each of these. And I will say that these are the kinds of principles that while these are tennis specific, could certainly be um, generalized to other types of sports programs. So the, the program starts with a group warm-up um, where everyone stands at the baseline. They do some stretches. They do some running. Um, this is also a chance for um, the kids to um, meet each other and meet their volunteers. There's an introduction that happens actually right before that group warm-up. The second activity is um, hand-eye coordination, and that includes things like bouncing the ball and rolling the ball. So that's in, you know, using ball skills, but at a very kind of basic level. Um, this is a skill, and this is an area that the group focuses much more on in the younger kids, and possibly um, this is almost the area of focus for some very young kids who really have never um, participated in any kind of activity that involves um, a ball. Uh, and I just want to emphasize here, so there's pictures of the kids here doing, you know, participating in the activities, but you'll also see these schematics, and those are actually part of a visual schedule. Um, and this visual schedule is something that is set up at the beginning of the program. There's a large one that's shown to the, um, to the families before they start. There's also small visual schedules that are provided to families if they would like them either to, you know, prepare their children for the program or even have them while they're going through these activities. Okay, so the next um, activity, if you will, is racket skills, and this is before they even start hitting balls. So this is, um, includes things like balancing the ball on a racket, um, rolling the ball um, with the racket. So again, just getting them used to holding the racket. Some kids have such significant um, motor challenges and low tone that even just holding the racket takes some practice, and so this is an area that is of focus here. Um, the next two modules are volleys and ground strokes, and they typically occur actually in the opposite order that I've shown you here, volleys first because they're a bit easier, and then ground strokes. The team starts with having children hit a ball off of a tee and just getting used to that motion of hitting a ball off of a tee, and as they gain proficiency, they can start hitting the ball, um, you know, with someone feeding it to them or even rallying with another child. Throughout all of this, you know, again, it's a one-on-one -on -one situation with a volunteer and a child, but they're working in parallel with other children. And so the goal is that, you know, be, that they're actually able to see what other children are doing and that there is some um, potential for social interaction as these um, activities are proceeding through their different stages. And then the program ends with some really fun, more social um, events, if you will. So the last, the, the second to last module is games. 
And these are things like, you know, you see a picture here, red light, green light, where the kids are at the baseline and they have to start running towards the net. Once the red light is shown, they have to freeze in their tracks. And then when the green light is shown, they can run again. Uh, games like that that are just meant to be sort of team building and fun. Um, I, I know when the program was developed, there was a lot of emphasis on making sure that this is fun, that there's play involved, that it's not just about teaching tennis skills. It's about letting the kids be kids and have fun as well. And then the group, and the, the um, session, the clinic ends with a final cheer where they say, one, two, three, we love tennis. And again, this is a way for children to sort of be in a group and enjoy this um, ability to participate. Uh, here I just have shown you a link of the, um, to, on the website that has clips of videos of all of these different um, modules. So I mentioned that there is a parent survey that's um, administered at the beginning and end of the program. And this initially was set up just to gauge general parent interest, involvement, and participation, um, uh, and of course, satisfaction with the program. And what's been really um, gratifying is that parents have seemed to be very um, satisfied with the program. So, and I think that this retention rate uh, is probably the best sign of how satisfied parents are with the program. So more than 90% of parents are sticking with it after participating in one session. And I will say from anecdotally, from my clinical experience, um, with my families, this is not always the case. Often parents will try many, many different programs and they just don't seem like a good fit, so they just switch to another one. So the fact that parents are staying, I think, is a really reassuring sign uh, for us. 98% per, uh, uh, reported that they were satisfied with the program. 93% recommended that they would definitely recommend, uh, stated that they would definitely recommend it to other individuals. Um, and 95% said that, that the program met or exceeded expectations. Um, we did ask qualitatively of parents what were the areas that they found most improved after participating in AC Autism. And those were tennis skills, social skills, motor skills, and confidence. Um, if you go to the yeah, next slide, um, you can actually see that just um, shown a bit more graphically. So, of course, you know, we would expect tennis skills, especially in children who've never held a racket before, um, to improve with this program. But what's really exciting is that it's not simply just tennis skills that are improving. Um, tennis skills um, are improving in um, conjunction with just overall motor skills and then social skills and confidence, which, you know, is a really exciting, I think, um, uh, result for us because what we fundamentally want is that our children are feeling more confident and are gaining more generalizable skills, right? Of course, we'd like them to play tennis and enjoy that experience, but tennis is really meant to be a platform for growth in these other developmental areas. We also did um, have reports of other areas of improvement, such as language, self-regulation and behavior, sleep, diet, and overall fitness. So, because actually um, of the work that Dr. Bott I mean, just talked about and the real need for um, applying more, I'd say, rigorous and maybe quantifiable um, metrics to measure outcomes, we are starting to implement some of those um, procedures with acing autism as well because we'd really like to know how else are children improving what are the specific areas that this program these types of programs um, are you know in what areas are they really specifically benefiting children that's important for two reasons one is that if we can really show um, broader benefits for these children it actually helps us justify the need for sports programs even as dr bot said if we as clinicians if we you know, can be prescribing these programs for children with autism, right? So we really would like to have more quantitative information on how these children are making gains. But it also helps us because it helps us re refine the program. If we, if we find that there are certain areas where children really aren't making gains and we'd like to see gains, um, or we see areas where children are, you know, still continuing to struggle, we might actually adapt the program a bit to help um, uh, help uh, target those areas. And so what, uh, some things that we've been doing more recently, and this will be really um, uh, taken to a larger level over the next um, year or so, is that we've been asking about adaptive skills through a standardized measure called the Vineland Adaptive Skills of Behavior. Um, and we have found that parents are reporting improvements in communication, coping skills, and fine motor skills. Um, we're also using something called a parent behavior checklist to examine behavioral challenges, and we see improvements in irritability and social withdrawal, which are specific scales on the ABC. And very soon, we will be actually measuring motor skills through the skate map that Dr. Bot showed you, as well as the movement assessment battery for children. 
I want to end by actually just, you know, emphasizing that this is just the start. And, you know, the program has been going on for 10 years, and it's really been, I think, incredible from the standpoint of the growth and the scalability of what's been built. But there's so much more to be done, and our board of directors and the staff are always thinking about ways to improve and expand. And I just want to highlight some of the initiatives that are being developed over the next, you know, hopefully year or two. The first is adult programs, and I actually saw a bunch of questions coming up on the participant feed about adults. And I totally agree. We keep talking about children, uh, and part of the reason is that this is such an uncharted area that we we all often tend to start with children and then, you know, try to scale into other um, populations. And the adult population with autism is a very, very um, important um, subset of, of individuals with autism that are not receiving the intervention that they should be. And uh, so we would actually really like to be developing some adult programming. And there is a subgroup that's now um, been developed through Acing Autism that is thinking about how do we adapt and modify some of the programs that have already been developed to meet the needs of adults on the spectrum. So hopefully that will be, again, launched um, on soon. We're also working to partner with autism schools. Um, right now, the programs um, are occurring at tennis clubs and other types of tennis facilities and also at high schools, um, meaning just you know, public, high school where there, public high schools where there's courts. Um, we'd like to do more partnerships with um, schools that have you know, a large population of children on the spectrum. Uh, it will provide, I think, a greater opportunity for children to participate because they won't have to travel to get to the program. Um, another initiative has been peer modeling. So, you know, we have siblings of children with autism who often are, are left sitting on the sideline while, they're, while their siblings participate. Could we use those siblings to help, to help their sibling in the program and to serve as peer models? This also could be then scaled out to other um, populations of just typically developing children who really do want to give back to their community in many ways. And so that's an initiative that's being developed. And then also we'd like to enhance our programs to support families, provide families with resources and outlets while they are in these programs watching their children play tennis. Uh, so on that note, I will um, end just by showing you one picture of uh, not all, but many of the program directors who meet once a year at the US Open. Um, this is, again, a huge team effort. Richard Sperling, who's the CEO, is in the middle there. Um, and this has really been a project that he's been wholly committed to for a decade and will continue to be. But it really takes a village of families and volunteers uh, and participants. And so uh, uh, I'm honored to be a part of the group. And um, I think there'll be very exciting things to come. All right. Thank you so much. This was excellent. Um, we did get a few questions in, um, so I'll ask as many as as we can get through before one. Um, this is probably for Dr. Wilson. Uh, the walking pattern that you showed um, in the individual with, with autism, um, is that typical and does it go away with age or is it consistent across ages? That's a very good question. So a couple of things. First to note that some of the walking patterns that I showed are those gait variables that we say, such as velocity or step width. In studies that have been done, it has been shown a little more consistently that individuals with autism have difficulty with those specific patterns. However, we don't have great studies of looking at these individuals with a range of abilities from very young in age all the way through adulthood. So that's something that we're doing here at UCLA is starting very young when they first just start walking at around 12 to 18 to 20 months of age, and then measuring that walking from that age throughout early childhood and even older in order to see whether or not this is typical of most individuals with autism and does it go away or does it persist? And that's really important for a couple of different reasons. One, as I noted, it's going to give us a better sense of what may be interventions that we want to develop. Because also, if we see that some of these are persistent over time, what can it be that we can implement really early that can change those later outcomes? If we see that they're really ever changing, then we might want to be thinking about other interventions or other ways to measure more specific motor function or motor difficulties in these individuals. Okay. Um, 
this question is for Dr. Jess. Are there resources available for um, families or individuals that want to start a program um, in their community where it doesn't exist already um, for acing? Yes, that's a great question, and it's actually been um, the way that many of the programs have been started, that either a tennis professional or a family member or an interested, you know, student uh, became really excited by the, you know, potential of acing autism and asked to start a program. And so, yes, that is possible. And what I would suggest is actually um, going onto the website, and there are, um, there is information to contact both Richard Sperling and Justin Belisario, who really run the operations, and they can actually directly connect with you and give you information about that. Okay. Um, and is it, are you either of you aware of any research into the benefits of physical therapy for autism? Yes, and I think that's something that I'm really glad actually somebody brought up that question. I didn't highlight that as much here in this talk. You know, in all honesty, partly due to the time that we have and some of the things that we wanted to focus on, uh, other activities and things that maybe aren't as frequently promoted that we know have benefits. But there's a tremendous amount of research on both physical therapy and occupational therapy for infants, children, adolescents, and even adults um, at risk for and with autism spectrum disorder. And I want to highlight that there's a tremendous amount of benefit with these interventions. <coughs> Excuse me. So when you might first go in uh, for and might receive a diagnosis, or in general, when you're going in for any sort of evaluation through early intervention services, through your clinician, it's very important that these things are screened for, and we consider that physical therapy, occupational therapy are given to individuals who have difficulties in growth motor and fine motor uh, function, but also we want to think about something that we often don't think about how it might be related, but is even speech therapy because we know that some of these motor difficulties can affect the way you're able to produce language or speech. So in addition to the benefits of physical therapy and occupational therapy, we also know that there is a lot of research in the benefits of speech therapy and how that might strengthen your ability to produce language. Okay. Um, are you aware of, um, or has there been any research into why some individuals might have motor deficits? Um, are they caused by some sort of neuro, like neurological reason or muscular issues or genes involved at all? Also, these are great questions. I'm very excited to be answering them. So there have been various different studies to really look at what are the, what is the underlying neurobiology or what really are, is it a neurologic deficit? Is it a muscular deficit? And we think largely in most individuals who don't have a genetic syndrome with autism that there is an underlying neurologic issue. And so there have been several studies, both MRI studies, imaging studies done by some brilliant researchers in autism, and even some EEG studies looking at whether or not areas such as the cerebellum, which controls a lot of movement, might be affected, or the striatum, we see some of the deep structures that also affect movement. And I can't say we've yet identified exactly what the cause is, but we're starting to gain an understanding and a better idea of what might be the issues. But that's some of the goal of this work is in order to really be thinking about what maybe brain underlying structures could be affected, we need to have a better sense of what exactly are these motor challenges and deficits. Like I mentioned before, not just being able to walk or not walk, but are you walking wider? Are you walking slower? That's gonna make me as a neurologist and other researchers and clinicians start thinking about, is it the cerebellum that's affected? Is it other areas of the brain? To answer the second part of that quickly is also the genetic syndrome. So we actually know now that, and in general, that, and there've been much more recent, very interesting research recently, that individuals with a genetic syndrome and autism, so genetic syndromes that are highly penetrant, we say for autism, often have much more motor difficulties and motor delays. And it's these motor delays and challenges that present early. And there are some indication in some recent studies where we see, if we see those profound motor delays, it actually leads us to do genetic testing. And a lot of those genetic disorders are also highly associated for autism as well. So that is a whole other area of research that we're doing here at UCLA and other researchers are doing is seeing maybe the differences in motor challenges and deficits in individuals with autism who have a known genetic syndrome and individuals with autism who do not have a known genetic syndrome and seeing if those things are different 
which in turn can give us a better idea of if there's specific underlying neurologic abnormalities leading to that. Great. Well, thank you so much again for uh, your time today. We really enjoyed the talk.